All right, part two of getting our hands bigger. In the first video, we covered surgical and chemical intervention to increase the size of the hand, and now we're going to look at the more practical side, the muscular hypertrophy. So first, let's look at the deeper muscles in the palm of the hand. First, we have the palmar interosse muscles. Palmar here, as in all anatomy, simply means on the bottom of, or as we know it in the hand, towards the palm of the hand. These have no tendons connecting them to the forearm, which house the majority of the more powerful wrist and finger operators. So these are entirely isolated inside the hand and function only on the fingers. So normally only three of these muscles are recognized, despite quite conclusive proof of the fourth being present in at least 80% of people. The polysole, meaning thumb, palmar interosse, which sits as the others do, but on the inside of the thumb bone. In regards to orientation, the middle finger sits, as you guess, centrally. Everything else seems to be oriented towards that. So you have two sides against the middle finger. You can also imagine this dividing line extending through the forearm, given the ulna and radial sides of it. So with the palm interosse, we have one attached to the first digit, or thumb, on the inside facing the middle finger. Another on the second, or index finger, on the side towards the middle finger. And then hopping over to the other side of the middle line, we have one on the fourth or ring finger, again on the side towards the middle finger, and the last one attaches to the little finger, also on the side facing towards the middle. They insert on the same side of these bones that the muscles originate from, so we can guess that they can only pull the fingers in one way. There is no wrapping around or twisting. So these muscles, since they attach on the insides of the finger, work to adduct, or pull the finger back inwards towards the middle line, which is the middle finger. Simply put, if we start with an open hand with widespread fingers, these muscles work to pull the fingers back together. So then, on the other side of the movement we just outlined, if we want to spread the fingers apart again, we find the next group of muscles, the dorsal interosse muscles. And just like we remembered palmar as the palm or the bottom of your hand, the dorsal group can be remembered like the dorsal fin or of a shark or a dolphin, which sits on the top of its body. So the dorsal interosse muscle sits towards the top of your hand. And these two, just like the palm interosse, sit between the carpal bones in the meat of the hand. You have one on the outside of the ring finger, one on either side of the middle finger, so you can move it left and right, and one on the outside of the index finger. Again, they do not connect to a forearm tendon and attach directly to the bones in the hand, so they are very small and isolated. Both the palmar and dorsal interosse also cross over the first knuckle joint, and so also assist in flexing the fingers at the first phalangeal bone joint outside of the meaty metacarpo part. The way that the fibres of the interosse sit also allows the muscle to be an active component in the finger's extension in the distal or most furthest out regions of the bones. And then onto the final of these deep muscles, the real finger flexors. These are the lumbrical muscles which also sit in the palm but above and along the carpal bone rather than beside them. Even with this more superficial position you still cannot really see them through the skin. But you can see the tendons shift and wiggle sometimes. These tendons run from the forearm down through the palm and to the fingers, and on these tendons sit the lumbricals, which, unlike most muscles, attach to the tendon rather than the bone, which gives a slightly more mobile ability. Fingers are, after all, much more dexterous than the larger limbs, but less strong and stable as a trade-off. These quite simply flex the finger at the first phalangeal joint. Again, you can see this function of these muscles by pressing the tips of your fingers against something with the fingers at 90 degrees. The last segments extend and the first segment flexes. If you hold this for a while with good pressure you'll be able to feel the muscles start to fatigue. But overall these muscles are quite small and delicate. They could be and often are hypertrophied with things like rock climbing or even piano playing, especially things that require pressing against things with the fingertips. You could theoretically make a small sling or belt and attach this to weights. Probably a cable would be simpler and then proceed to do finger curls, making sure not to shift the load from the finger flexors in the palm to the forearms. Then you could also possibly use this belt to do finger abductions and adductions too, but this is an awful lot of work to hypertrophy muscles that either do not play much of a role in arm wrestling or get hypertrophied and worked well enough in the sport itself. You can probably imagine things like finger pressure on an opponent's hand, or training cupping or using a right angle shaped handle to shift weights, works these muscles quite well, so looking for specific exercises outside of this might be a little time-wasting. But things like the classic rice bucket hand workout, or squeezing tennis balls, or perhaps a tennis ball-shaped handle for cable work, 
Anything that requires the fingers to fight resistance from an open and out position into a close and in position. So some flexion and some adduction might work quite well. But let's get on to the muscles that could really add some size to your hands. These are the muscles sat at the base of your thumb and along the ulna side of the palm beneath the little finger. First, the abductor digiti minimi. It sits on the outside of the hand's palm, attached at the pisiform bone in the base of the palm, the bony segment just above the wrist. Then inserts on the outside of the first segment of the little finger and works to abduct the finger outwards. Second, the flexor digiti minimi. Also on the outside of the hand's palm, it attaches at the hamate bone, again at the base of the palm, and inserts again at the base of the little finger, but this one works to flex the first segment of the little finger. Third, opponent's digiti minimi. This one attaches a little inside from the edge of the palm, crossing over and inserting onto the outside of the pinky carpal bone. Its function is to assist in movement towards the opposing side of the hand, that being the thumb. So when you grab a ball or touch your little finger to the tip of the thumb, that rotation of the outside of the hand under the little finger, creating a deeper cavity in the palm, is a function of this muscle. And then finally the palmaris brevis. This is a squarish shaped muscle which sits very superficially on the ulnar side of the palm. And you can see it flex when you grip something tightly, especially a round object like a ball. This muscle does not actually work on any of the bones in the hand. Instead, it attaches to the palmar aponeurosis, which is a big block of fibres in the palm, connecting all of the fingers and muscles into the forearm, and also attaches at the flexor retinaculum, a fibrous connective tissue forming a protective roof against your forearm flexor tendons and the medial nerves, which is the part you press down against to develop carpal tunnel syndrome. And then it connects to the skin, which is why you can see it flex so clearly. The palmaris brevis works to tighten the palmar aponeurosis, that web of connective tissue in the palm, to create a stronger and more stable structure when gripping tightly. Given the very superficial position of this muscle, this might be the easiest way to see growth in the hand with the least effort, combined with the most outer radial muscles, the abductor digiti minimi and opponent's digiti minimi, which basically all work towards a ball-shaped grip. So things like throwing balls, or even just gripping hands, but also captains of crush type workouts should do well to train these muscles. Now onto the final and the most meaty section, the thumbs base. If you've ever held hands with a very seasoned arm wrestler, or even just seen an experienced manual labourer, you probably have noticed how hypertrophied and bulbous this specific section of the hand is versus a standard one. These are called the thena muscles, and there are four of them. Basically, you can imagine where the muscles are and how much space they take in the palm of the hand by starting at the first knuckle of the thumb and then drawing a triangle from it to just beneath the first knuckle of the middle finger and then travelling straight down until you hit the base of the palm and then back to the first knuckle. So you can see we have a lot of real estate to work with here. And since it sits so superficially above the rest, just like the little finger's musculature, it would be a very efficient part of the hand to train and hypertrophy. First we have the flexor pollicis brevis, which attaches at the base of the palm and runs up to the first bone joint, crossing into the first visible segment, and it works to flex the thumb at this first joint. Then we have the abductor pollicis brevis, which attaches at the base of the thumb at the wrist, runs along the outer edge of the thumb and connects on the outside of the thumb's first visible segment. It is the most superficial muscle, and you can see it as the bulging round muscle beneath the first knuckle. This one works to abduct the thumb, meaning to move it away and outward from the midline, but also works to assist flexion of the thumb and opposition movement, which is moving it towards the pinky finger in a ball grip. Then the opponent's pollicis muscle, which runs along the thumb's carpal bone, attaching at the palm's base and inserting on the outside of the first visible thumb segment. It works primarily to move the thumb in opposition, so towards the little finger, as it would be positioned with fine, precise gripping, like holding a pen. Lastly, we have the adductor pollicis, which is a large fan-shaped muscle that spans from the centre of the palm all the way out to inside of the first visible thumb segment. As the name suggests, this works to adduct the thumb, to move it closer to the midline. It is a very strong adductor compared to the others since it has such a wide reach. It also works alongside the other muscles in opposition towards the little finger. So you can see that the thumb has a lot of muscles working in three primary vectors. Inwards, towards the middle, outwards, away from the middle, and extension, away from the side. 
all of these muscles attach near the base of the first visible thumb segment, so loading it is quite simple, and you have almost definitely seen it done in arm wrestling. Pronation training, done with the belt wrapped around the thumb, loads these muscles by forcing them to work so that the thumb does not tear off the hand. This is normally quite isometric, but you can usually see some movement towards the end of pronation as the load on the thumb lightens from the position shifting. But normally pronation training is done with loads to hit the stronger, bigger muscles in the forearm, so the thumb is unable to do much other than hold on. If you did want more active thumb base work, it would just be a case of lighting the load and holding the hand in a semi-supinated position with a strap or belt around the thumb, letting the weight pull the thumb away and then flexing to pull the thumb back in towards the little finger. Top roll on the table too will hit the thumb base since the hand is pronating around the thumb bones and with the opponent resisting provides resistance against the thumb. So in summary, top roll, pronation with a belt around the thumb, and lighter loads in the same setup with focused thumb flexion should do well to hypertrophy this muscle group, which is why you see experienced arm wrestlers with hypertrophy muscles in this group. For the little finger, you could do the opposite by wrapping the belt around the little finger, gripping tightly and performing supination. Of course, these should probably be very carefully loaded as the muscles involved are very small and delicate, so probably less maxing out on the pinky. Hook 2 should work well for the pinky side since there is more squeezing pressure towards that side of the hand, especially in a defensive position. Captains of crush type tools too would help hypertrophy both sides of the palm since you are working the opposition of both the thumb and little finger. For the deep palm muscles we talked about first, hypertrophying them might be a bit of a wasted effort since they aren't actually visible, but strengthening them would not be a bad thing although they probably get strengthened well enough with everyday use, especially for people in the gym, and especially, especially for arm wrestlers. Supplementing with special pancakes and sauces will help to exaggerate these effects too, but on the whole I'd say arm wrestling itself done properly will do a good job if given time to thicken the muscles of the hand. So basically this video has been a waste of time, but whatever, it was informative. Let me know down below if there's anything you want to know. But we're done here, so I'll see you later.